mimicking point of view, you see that the, the fungi really becomes this like selfless mediator between, uh, between other organisms. You know, it's the, it's the medium through which other organisms can then communicate with each other for the sake of forming better relationships and symbiosis and collective health. Um, and it also has this like this this balancing harmonious kind of like role that it plays, you know, in the sense that it never takes more than what it needs. It never it never cheats or steals or you know what I mean, like like, like hoards too much for itself. It always does the work with the collective in mind, and I, I really like that about them. Obviously, there's competition on the fungal yeah. in the fungal kingdom, as there's always yeah. comp competition. <laughs> This is definitely like a, a topic that I'm genuinely interested in. Oh, yeah. um, I was thinking this morning, like the first time, and it's so vivid in my in my memory of when I got introduced to this whole field of, of mycology. Yeah. Somebody sent me a podcast, and it's probably cliche in terms of this field, but it was Paul Stamets and Joe Rogan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love it. Two of my, yeah. my favorite people to listen to, yeah. And somebody was like, okay, you've got to listen to this podcast. And it's on mushrooms. So I was like, okay, cool. It must be interesting. It's probably about magic mushrooms. You know? I was like, okay, let me, let, let's give it a listen. But I, I was on a plane, and I was flying. I don't know where I was flying, but I downloaded it, and I sat there listening to Paul explain this whole fungal kingdom and the mycelium and how that like trees can talk to each other. And I was mm. like, holy shit, this is fascinating. Yeah. Uh, I felt like there was a whole magical world under our feet that we have no idea about. Or most people didn't. And I, mm. um, I was really, really fascinated. So it's just, it's mind blowing how much more there is to the fungal kingdom than we are, you know, I suppose conventionally taught. Yeah. So it's fascinating, sure. man. Um, so yeah, that was my kind of introduction to it, and since then I've looked at mushrooms in a whole new light. Yeah, uh, I love that. I love that because for a lot of people, that that kind of aha moment was one or two other things, and that was, uh, well, either psychedelic experience on mushrooms or the documentary which featured Paul Stamets was a fantastic fungi. Yeah, because yo, um, I think well the world. Mycology as a science is still very much in its infancy, but the world was kind of behind on the, the wows of, of fungi until that documentary came out or until Paul Stamets did that podcast was a big boom, you know, and I think fan, like Fantastic Fungi was looking for funding for years before that, you know, and I think that that podcast and a few other like Paul Stamets like YouTube videos were, did a lot of work to get, get the the knowledge and information out there, but the, the wow factor really only boomed in the last two years. And I want to say the first five years before those two years um, was a really tough sell, you know, like having, having a conversation like this with friends and family around fungi and how cool they are on mushrooms. I'd be like, fuck this. This long haired, <laughs> this long haired dude just talking about mushrooms, you know, it's like, it's, it was such a like alternative hippie thing. And like, I'd, I'd, I'd have a really tough time to convince most people to like just just yeah. listen for two more sentences, you know. It um, is. I Even back then, that was a few years ago, and I thought, okay, wow, this is going to change the world. But still, it's been slow. Yeah. And like you said, the Fantastic Fungi documentary, which is phenomenal, yeah. has come out now. And, and there seems to be, it seems to be gaining more traction, the, the interest in this field. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, even me, I'd listen to something and be like, Lion's Mane is the next big thing. Where can I find Lion's Mane? And then like nobody would have it. And then yeah. we'd like, okay, but where can I get this? And so it's, it's been slow, but there is definitely an increase in, in I suppose, interest. In yes, this field. So of it's, course. It's cool and exciting. And, uh, you know, from the sort of cyber side of things to the, the massive health benefits in all of these different types of mushrooms. And it's, just, mm. it's really, really interesting. Yeah, it oh, really is limitless in a way, yeah. It is, yeah. yeah. Um, before we delve straight into that, let's uh, let's kick off like how did you how did you what sparked your interest in in <laughs> <laughs> in this whole field and how did you yeah. get into it? Um, yeah, I laugh because um, because the story changes depending on who asks, you know, um, and um, or at least there's different versions to the story depending on who asks and. Um, I guess I'm, I'm getting more and more comfortable to to kind of say that that my initial interest sparked because of having an experience with 
so psilocybin mushrooms, you know, and um, it was a very small um, experience with um, with them. And it, ever since that day, it was just, uh, it was wow and excitement and what was that, you know, and it was a complete, a complete, renewal of what I thought was possible in this world and for psychology and and um, the insights that it gave me into my person and personality and life that I've been living and the own my own traumas that I was carrying and my own like lack and perspective and it was it was it was a big wake up smack you know um and in the right direction so the interest definitely sparked in and i was kind of blown away by that something so seemingly insignificant could could hold the key to such a uh uh such potential for healing and discovery and and curiosity um yeah, and it was a slow process as well, you know, ever since then I'd start noticing little mushrooms that pop up in the garden or I don't know, it's a, a book or a topic or something with related, you know, you'd kind of start noticing at a friend's house maybe like um, they had oyster mushrooms and you'd be like, wow, oh, I've never seen those, mm-hmm. you know, but I just started noticing them in more aspects and then subsequent experiences followed from there and after after some some time and a relatively uh, powerful experience that kind of brought me a lot of healing i i felt called to uh, to call to what's the word called to purpose you know called to duty with regards to like yeah yeah yeah, (laughs) and to to kind of forward the message you know like in a way to i guess kind of kind of preach that yeah, you know <laughs> that's kiff. and um my love for them as i guess beings if you will and yeah. organisms um that that holds the potential for healing not mm-hmm. only and, and of, uh, after that journey i discovered a lot of videos on paul stamets and okay. he's got a very famous one on youtube called i think it's six ways mushrooms can save the world okay and that one that one was huge to me because um i realized that they don't only hold the key to heal a lot of what ails humanity's psyche uh but also what ails um our world and our ecosystems mm-hmm. and environments and I, I found that those two are kind of interconnected you know yeah. it's the it's the damaged disconnected psyche um that humans have and the disconnect that we have in a relationship with ourselves. you know the kind of higher self i guess yeah. uh that leads to the and the separation that comes from that that leads to the destructive behaviors that follow mm-hmm. so i kind of started viewing them as as this tool or this ally that can be used to heal human systems and environmental systems um yeah and then i found out about micromediation and filtration through andrew who started harmonic mycology with me okay um he was i owe him i owe him uh uh a debt of gratitude, so to speak, as well, just for the awareness that he brought, you know, because for a long time, Mushrooms and my way was like Paul Stammers on YouTube, the odd book here and there, like cool stories about people's, other people's experiences, maybe my own experiences, like little drawn pictures, you know, it was um, predominantly based around listening to like Terrence McKenna and Joe Rogan experience yeah. in the early days, um, like so psychedelics and then Paul Stamets talk about these medicinal mushrooms but it wasn't until I met Andrew that he actually introduced me to the fact that there's this whole essentially science based around uh, mushroom or fungi rather Uh, I didn't know the difference back then and I'll get into that now (laughs) but he said um, he was talking about turkey tail this mushroom that grows on Table Mountain you know and you can find it in the green belts and it grows quite uh, prolifically as well as like it's easily identifiable. So I was like, those two things are exactly what I need right now. I spend a lot of time in the mountain, an yeah. easy to identify mushroom that has no poisonous lookalikes and that grows in abundance yeah. and it offers all these medicinal benefits. So I was like, this is my avenue for exploration. So turkey tail became the first mushroom that I identified and foraged and like made little tinctures and teas with, you know, and I kind of started started that journey. And then Andrew... So quick, sorry, could you yeah. interject something before I forget? I was it. thinking about uh, 
post damage security's mom of uh, did she have breast cancer yes. with turkey tail? With like turkey he tells tail. that story and it's mind blowing. Yeah, absolutely. It's from from terminal I think stage for breast yeah, cancer. Yeah. You know, and that's something that really pulls on on people's heartstrings as mm. well. You know, because it's it's those are times that that you kind of feel helpless. Yeah. You know, to find an ally like that and something that can at least aid mm. in the in the process of healing. It's yes. it's. It gets people emotionally yeah. on board, and it's a it's a beautiful story. Um, so at the moment, I wasn't treating anything necessarily, you know, but it was I just had this like this spark for for engaging with the mushroom that's legal, mm. that's available, that's medicinal, you know. It had it kind of fit fit all the all the the, the yeah. checkpoints in that sense. Um, and then throughout that journey alone, like kind of going to the forest, learning a few spots, and now noticing. A few other mushrooms that pop up, you know, because now I'm going here, uh, uh, see uh, different seasons, so you yes. see different times of the forest, different times of the year, like what comes up, what plants die back, what's there. So looking for mushrooms became this kind of vehicle for me to start learning more about plant ecology and uh, uh, mm. um relationships that fungi have to certain plants and which grows when and what time of the year and what conditions they prefer so like really just going looking for mushrooms kind of like popped a whole yeah. a whole ethos for me you know it's this this relationship yes. with um, with my immediate environment and then yeah, I didn't realize the foraging was actually quite a big thing to actually go out and look for <laughs> yeah, especially these days it's so cool man like, yeah. and it's like mildly competitive but it's also <laughs> like yeah um, I'll get to that now as well like my um 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 I see, see people walking in the forest now and they're like with their eyes glued to the ground and you're like they're either looking for something they lost or they're looking for mushrooms you know and then they look up and you can catch eye you go like you know, you're like, yeah, I know what you're doing. And then they're like, have you found anything, you know? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, I love that Absolutely. culture, man. And it's growing. It's growing so rapidly now. And it was, mm. um, yeah, I I'm, 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 will digress down that road. But just to finish the, the introduction into the sphere. So Andrew went in the weeks to follow, uh, decided that he was going to go to South America, okay. pack his bags, get all the gear. And he was going to cycle from south to north. I can't Jesus. remember the whole trip okay. that he did. But it took him nine months. And during wow. this journey, yeah, he, he went and volunteered at permaculture farms, but as well as mushroom farms, okay. uh, where they were growing essentially to scale, using very, very, very low-tech techniques, because they didn't mm. have, unlike America, access to all the, the fancy pressure cookers and all the gear and the bags, and you know, so they were like figuring things out with like bare minimum. But it was during his time there that he had met somebody that put him in contact with a guy in America that was producing these mushroom and mycelium powders in bulk. Okay. Um, and he agreed that he would sell us small quantities at a discounted rate, which was very, very uh, kind of him. Yeah. Um, and we kind of got started, you know, maxed out his credit card to get like a shipment of this mythical lion's mane and cordyceps mushrooms, you know, um, <laughs> in these quantities. And then we started the product line from there. Uh, like yeah. even looking back at like how things went in, it's, it's so cringy, but like you have to, you have to start somewhere, yeah. right? And yeah, so that was, then, then that was kind of the, the start of harmonic mycology and then um, my venture into not only discovering medicinal mushrooms, but discovering the, the benefits from lion's mane and cordyceps mm. as somebody that's really physically active like that changed uh, my training completely because mm. now I wasn't so stimulant dependent um, to go training. Okay. You know, which which you also, as somebody that's physically yeah. active, realizes like there's, I think the whole fitness industry is so pre-workout stimulating yes. dependent, you know, yeah. so now we can nourish our endocrine system and take care of our bodies and, and combat inflammation while getting energy instead of like kind of, kind of getting energy on a loan, so to speak, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and then from there, I, I mean, I guess the rest is history, you know, like that yeah. sparked. Andrew came back, he'd already had, I think about seven years of cultivation experience at that point. Mm. Um, so he came back with more knowledge from uh, volunteering at these permaculture, uh, at these mushroom farms in South America. Um, so that when he came back, like, systematically we had like made a few hundred rand here and there, you know, so we could like buy some equipment and we would literally go from like 500 rand to 500 rand to like get more equipment and better gear and like yes. things to like 
grow these mushrooms out. We've never had any funding or major cash input from any one of our sides or families or friends and anything. So the whole business to this day was built on on sales, you know. So it's been slow. It's been very yeah. slow. There's still a lot of things that I need to yeah. produce lines, man, at the higher quantities and all that. But but I wouldn't have it any other way, yeah. Well, that's Kiff, man. And you've been doing this for a few years now and like... I didn't know you before, but I've been using your harmonic mycology range. And yeah. to see that you've created something like that is really cool, man. So, yeah, well done, bro. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, that's, 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 that's a really good feeling still it's, to this day. Yeah, yeah. It's honestly cool. Um, yeah. Sure, so much to touch on there. I think I will just add, like, I also, my interest also sparked from a psychedelic psilocybin experience okay. where I felt like, for the first time in my life, I could see the world. I had mm. this experience where I just like saw the mountains and the clouds and the like, and I had this experience of like expanded consciousness. And I mm. thought to myself, "What is this?" And since then, I've ex- explored many things. But I feel like the mushrooms. If I'd never ever explored that road, I would probably be a different person by now. Yeah. Uh, I really feel yeah. that. And I, I know you mentioned earlier um, the the bean. I feel like there is. On an esoteric level, there is there's a intelligence in this fungal net, fungal mm. kingdom that is something we don't understand. And I mm. think um, you also mentioned Terence McKenna and, and his like stoned ape hypothesis, which is yeah. super fascinating. And yeah. it's, it's just an idea that you know back in the day we ca- uh, we came across these mushrooms, which then expanded our consciousness, and yeah, we are today kind Over of. Over the course of a few million years, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah Paul Stamets actually actually puts it the best because this is something that like enhances visual acuity and understanding of like geometric shapes, you know, and um, Mm. it enhances courage um, as well as compassion, you know, and those two qualities are leadership qualities, you Mm. know, and um, yeah, and then continually have those experiences over the course of a few hundred thousand years is like, um, as like, I guess, unevolved um, Mm. kind of, humanoid or I, I don't, don't know the terms in that <laughs> in history I'm like yeah. terrible with that yeah. um, if it's not mushroom related yeah but yeah and then like it forward like it it, it, it speeds up the evolution of, of the yeah. human brain's development and um, yeah I mean it's not that far fetched uh, if you yeah. really if you've had these experiences and you've seen yeah. and um like I've had, I guess, what you would say like downloads or conversations with them as well and that's where my idea of them like being Mm. beings or sentient or intelligent like hyper intelligent and advanced kind of comes from is because there's this there's this definite sense of presence you know and there's this like this urge to kind of like like let you know mm. um that, that there's a better way to do things there's a better way to look after your health there's a better way to like engage with your loved ones and your family yeah. members and like um, to take care of your emotional body and how you relate to the people in your life and the strangers that you come across, you know, and the ripple effect that that has on the uh, community, immediate and extended, and then the ripple effect that it has in each one of those people's lives in the way, you know, so it's this, it's this extreme responsibility. The way we behave and treat people and love people and help people is this extreme responsibility towards global well-being um ecologically speaking as well because kind of translates into how we interface or interact with with the environment you know the foods we eat how much we care for ourselves so it's yeah the i think i think those insights kind of comes with like a big realization that every word you you utter every conversations you have every hug you give like has meaning you know and it's it's our responsibility to almost to like to to care for that and better ourselves um, and it's because of these insights that I've, I also would have liked yourself been on a majorly different path um, had I not had these experiences. Mm. Um, and it's because of that that I kind of feel like I, I owe them. I owe them something for mm. that for those insights, you know. And I've, I've I've grown to to love and respect them a lot for yeah. for those insights and for the, the kind of knowledge gained and the healing uh, yeah. that came from that. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. I there is there is a deeper intelligence that these these plants have for us if we're open to it. I mm. really believe that. I I want to I want to touch on the mycelium, uh, which is super fascinating for me. The, the yeah. uh, and for me, yeah. I, I I feel like everything is like a microcosm of the macrocosm. So you, mm. whether you zoom out or you zoom in, everything like 
kind of looks so if you look at like a mycelium network or if you look at the brain neurons or you look at galaxies you look at yeah. it's super fascinating um the mycelium network that that is underground connecting connecting all of this it's it's integral in the soil health integral in you know decomposing uh, trees and, and mm. creating good good soil all of these things um, yeah w- where do we even start with mycelium? Like, wh- how, mm. what is this and how does it work? God, what a loaded question. Um, I love <laughs> it, though. Like, uh, I, I want to explore this, and there's so many avenues that I could, like, at least forward the, mm. the, the, the what is this question. Because um, I'll, I'll start off by saying, like, I don't know. Yeah. I don't think anybody quite yes. understands just yet. Um, maybe we will in the next 100 years yeah. um, as we continue to form a better relationship with fungi as, as beings and intelligent organisms. And as we continue to understand them and study them scientifically and also non-scientifically. Um, but to where we are at right now with my understanding and my understanding is based on people who I trust in this field, you know, the Paul Stamets mm. and uh, the Peter McCoys um, and a few other uh, mentionable, mentionable names. Um, but mycelium, first of all, is the body of the fungal organism. So fungi, the kingdom or queendom, fungi. Um, so this is also another thing, sorry. So my limited understanding initially was like, oh, that's a mushroom, but the mushroom is not the... <laughs> The end of it's like if you look at a body, it's not the whole body; it's a little piece exactly. of. Exactly. There's a whole other system going yeah. on there that you can't see. Yo, Is that correct? The mushrooms actually play a really, sm- funnily enough, the mushrooms actually play a really small part in the life cycle, or I guess goal or purpose of the fungal organism. Um, so the fungal organism, there are what 1.5 million species of fungi um, in the world. Only 20,000 of those produce mushrooms. So extremely small amount, really, in comparison to the total that actually produces these, I guess, above ground reproductive towers. And I'll explain what that is just in a second. But so the actual body of the fungus is this mycelial network. Um, It's this filament, filament is decentralized, chemically complex, um, highly intelligent Um, network so it doesn't have a centralized point of decision making or digestion or Mm -hmm. immunity but instead like every single cell within that organism and network is constantly essentially thinking for itself as part of the whole um and this makes them extremely effective. Uh, This makes them extremely effective in the specifically in the environments they grow in but also uh, these networks have been modeled across kind of existence. You know, it's in the neural network of the human and mammalian brain. Mm. Um, the internet's modeled behind the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's like we, it's almost like nature kind of mimics these patterns. These, yes. These networks. Yeah, yeah. Because it's a highly effective way of kind of decentralizing a network. Mm. And I can go around decentralized networks as a completely different podcast, just on how we can mimic that in a societal level and how we can yeah, do that yeah, as yeah, a way yeah. to decentralize our grid. We need to get grid. decentralized because the centralized system it's, it's is not working. It's not working. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's profitable, so like, it'll yeah. stay for as long as yeah. whoever continues to put up a good fight, you uh, know. Yeah. But, um, that's a whole nother topic. That's a whole nother topic. <laughs> oh, we can rant yeah. about that for hours, yeah. Yeah. Um, but so they are, they are the masterminds of chemistry. Fungi are the masterminds of chemistry. So when a spore germinates, it creates a hyphal thread. And when, when two genetically compatible uh, hyphal threads join each other, they start to form a mycelial network. Okay. A little bit of a fungal biology background is where we'll lose most people, so we'll mm. leave it at that. But they communicate, think, digest, defend, attack, essentially mm. exist chemically. Yeah, so it's not just a link underground. It's like a whole, yes. there's a whole organism living, doing all these different functions. Exactly, you know, and it's like as we find plants and mushrooms with certain compounds in them and vitamins in them or minerals in them, we often think like, oh, this is what they have. Now, mycelium isn't isn't like that from from a supplemental perspective. Mycelium isn't like that because it's it doesn't only produce this chemical and that metabolite and these acids and that mm-hmm. enzymes. It's constantly producing and figuring out new things 
if it needs to. So if it comes across a new food source that it's never before yet uh, b- before encountered, then it starts to combine what it already has in its toolkit, and in this sense, it's fairly limitless, you know, and with yeah. regards to what they can produce on a chemical level, but they'll start trying out certain combinations and certain ratios of what chemicals they can produce to, say, break down this new food source. Eventually, oftentimes, most of the times, really, they'll learn. And then, say, that happened at the northern end of the mycelial network. That's instantly learned across the entire network, regardless of how large this network is. Um, but they can do the same thing. And so this is, oh, you'd stop me at any time. No, no, no. It's, just, it's so interesting. Yeah. Go but on. they do the same thing when they come across a new potentially competitive fungus, you know, and they either have to like draw like a chemical line to defend their territory or advance forward with chemical warfare to destroy this competitor so that they can claim the food source or claim the territory. So they are extremely clever at coming up and quick um, at coming up with new chemical compounds and new chemical concoctions to do exactly that, to defend, attack, eat, think, communicate. Um, And this is why they hold so much potential for medicine, for for medicinal or medical applications, because now we can start looking at not only supplements and food and tempehs and uh, uh, mycelial fermented brown rice or chickpeas as a as a, f- a really cheap to produce medicinally or immunologically active food source but we we really see that how we can like use fungi and this is how antibiotics were discovered by Fleming um, is that we can start using fungi to produce novel antiviral and antibacterial compounds that we can then isolate uh, synthesize or somehow expand this is where my knowledge comes to an end in pharmacology <laughs> but we can also say, for instance, Dan gets a brand new virus that's never yet seen before. We could like somehow isolate that virus, expose it to a host of different mycelial cultures on a Petri dish and see which, which of those cultures okay. can produce, um, rapidly produce antiviral compounds that could be active against this specific virus. Now we're looking at personalized medicine that, can, that only takes weeks to develop or at least discover, you know, and then um, um, expand it from there. So now we're looking at a potentially limitless wealth of potential medicinal compounds. And this is why Paul Stamets, I believe, went and essentially declared the protection of the old growth forest as a, as a matter of national defense, you know, because it's this... Um, it's this... Um, it's this untapped resource of potential fungal strains that mm-hmm. could hold the key to overcome pandemics or overcome. We don't get censored on this podcast <laughs> for bringing up certain 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 words. But yeah, it, it seems like it's limitless. Why aren't we yeah. using more of this? Like to to just solve. The, it seems like it could solve so many problems we have in the world. And sure. a big one is sure. is definitely like soil health. Like yes. people are worried about like climate change, but if we don't sort out the soil issue, we got bigger problems. Sure. Absolutely. Um, yeah, the sorry, carry on. No, no, sorry. I'm like this can literally keep going. So if you have yeah. something to say, there's so many avenues to that this can go in. But there's these this chemical brilliance that can also be used obviously for medicine, healing human systems, but it's this chemical brilliance that can also get used in aiding the remediation um, and reforestation of uh, like certain environmental issues, you know, so we can expose certain strains of mycelial bags to like oil contaminations, you know, and there are projects doing this at the Amazon micro remediation project is one of them. If anybody that wants to go look that up, doing phenomenal work in clearing up oil spills in the Ecuadorian rainforest Mm. left by a big oil company. Now, and this is because hydrocarbons, uh, oils are essentially very old trees, if you want to simplify yeah. it, you know. So it's like a few steps up up the ladder from what they're already used to. So they go through this figuring out process of what new compounds or mixture of compounds to produce to break down this food mm-hmm. source, potential food source, in this case, the oil. And then it will essentially break down the carbon bonds um, and use that for fungal sugars and essentially remediate the oil spills this can also be done by potential contaminants running down from dairy farms and bacterially contaminated water running into streams you know yeah like so runoff from like 
fertilizers and pesticides and that, I suppose you could tackle issues like that. Yes, definitely. That's you know, so now now we can start breaking down pollutants in the environment. Um, and we can also use them um, um, and inoculate, say, places that needs to be reforested with mycorrhizal fungi that could speed up the growth and the health of that forest and essentially speed up the, the, the reforestation um, yeah. of those areas. So it, the potential in that regard is really largely undiscovered. There's a lot of people doing good work on small scales. I believe they did a few years back at Speer here in Stellenbosch as well. They had okay. some sort of... Um, um, some sort of filtration, microfiltration system going on there. Um, I'm not too sure about the details around that. But yeah, so this is the the, the potential for my mycological, but more more accurately mycelial applications. Um, so that's what the mycelium is. That's the fungi. Now, some twenty thousand of these fungi produces uh, mushrooms. So mm. mushrooms are the reproductive organ. The mm. um, the I, I forget who called it that, but towers of sex, you know, that that, yeah. that, uh, that their single purpose is to sprout above ground the production of spores and the dispersal of those spores to potentially get taken on by winds or carried yeah. off by insects or us humans when we forage them or it gets on our clothes yeah. when we walk through the forest, you know, so we become like inoculants um, yes. uh, or spore carriers for them. And then these spores, hopefully hundreds of millions of them gets released, finds a new food source and the species proliferates. That's, that is so fascinating. I literally, so I've, I've looked at the um, kind of archetypal or the, the energies around some of these plants. And then a lot of, a lot of people will talk about, for instance, the psilocybin or even the, the cactus, the San Pedro's and the uh, Peruvian torches and those mm -hmm. plants in the psychedelic space as being a masculine energy. Okay. And it's interesting, yeah. like you say, it's a reproductive organ, but it almost kind of mimics the phallus, you know, yeah, the, <laughs> the sure. male energy. And for it's interesting sure. because these experiences are quite a yeah, masculine archetypal kind of grounding energy and then you get some are, are more of the feminine. But it's interesting, mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. had that... And it releases spores, which then go and populate, and, and it's, it's it's interesting how yeah the masculine how the yeah play. how the the kind of like architectural mm. structure of some if not most of them are kind of like mimics that, yeah you know? yeah yeah it's for sure and spores and sperm you know it's exactly like, yeah sure <laughs> that's very interesting it sure. is very interesting and it's it's yeah just even spores alone is a conversation for a conversation on its own you know they are okay. extremely intelligent by design and how how resilient they are and how effectively they get dispersed you know so in layman's terms will a spore separate blow in the wind land somewhere and then start its own exactly yeah that do, okay. so that a spore will be if you want to simplify this this um, analogy kind of falls apart really quickly but it would be the seeds to what okay. yeah it would be the seeds to what that mushrooms produce okay. so these spores will get taken by the wind or insects or animals or humans um or okay. most of it actually just drop down straight underneath the mushroom yeah. itself. Um, but And some mushrooms actually create their own little air pressure pockets right at the bottom of the gills as to like to pro pro uh, propel the spores, yeah. you know, to give it a better chance to get caught by the winds that's, or something. That's fascinating. That's man. incredible. And um, their sensory capabilities as well. But, but oftentimes then people, it's really hard to imagine mushrooms and mycelium as one thing because yeah. oftentimes for most people they don't see the mycelium yeah. you maybe see some that's some, exactly it yeah. yeah exactly right you see some white rotty stuff at the bottom of a log when you've kicked open and they're like Ugh, you know and i understand i still sometimes feel that as well you know when i kick over a log and it's particularly yellow or slimy i'm also going like oh but most people can't draw that connection because they don't have access to mycelium as a as a tangible thing in front of them. And even people who, who has grown mushrooms, but is not involved, first of all, in the entire process or hasn't, hasn't really like spent a lot of time with multiple different species and different strains within the same species to really see how each, each one of them are like, have their own individual personalities. They respond differently to different stimuli and environmental conditions and food sources and some of them are more temperamental than others but it's only once you start forming that that connection with them I guess personally that you start realizing that that 
the mushroom and the mycelium is not separate. Because if I go into the forest and I pick turkey tail or I pick reishi or I find Huisium corioloides, our kind of like native lion's mane cousin, I can take this mushroom back to the lab and I'm going to simplify for the sake of this conversation and for the sake of people's interest. Yeah. Um, but you can take, uh, cut a piece of the tissue of the actual mushroom's flesh, um, different mushrooms, once again, it's different process, but place that on a nutritive solution on a Petri dish and that mushroom will re-myceliate. And that's not because the mushroom somehow knows how to become mycelium. It would be the equivalent of like cutting a piece of apple and planting a piece of apple in a pot plant and then like two weeks later you have like a tree sprouting, you know. So, so it's really hard to understand, but that's when you start understanding that the mycelium changes its cellular structure and weaves itself together in a way to produce this tower, this mycelial tower that's, that we call mushrooms. So... Mushrooms and mycelium are not separate in that way. The only thing is that the mushroom is designed with a short lifespan okay. in, um, in mind, you know, yeah. and oftentimes with certain attractant factors, you know, like stink horns, they, they give off this extremely foul smell that, that smells of rotting flesh or, you know, like sometimes if the kelp's been on the beach for, yeah. for too long, it just, it smells horrible, yeah. you know, and that attracts flies and other things so that it can come like, come like essentially bathe themselves in spores and when they fly off they disperse those spores so they have these different attractant factors but they are mycelial towers and it's because of that reason you can take a piece of flesh from a mushroom and revert that back to mycelium and I'll I'll conclude I won't go down that road now because we will get there eventually but that's why from my perspective the mycelium is really as of yet the untapped source of potential nu mm. nutritive and medicinal compounds is because that's where the, the the organism lies, the complexity lies, the thinking lies. You know, it's 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 a it's a living, intelligent organism. Sort of exactly. sounds like, and, and like you say, we focus on oh, what type of mushroom are we getting, but we're missing potentially the whole ben range of benefits from the mycelium network. Yes. Um, Something else that fascinated me, and this is super layman's terms, but is this correct that the mycelium network, potentially, like, if you could have, like, one tree here and one tree, like, down here, and this one tree is lacking, like, nutrients mm -hmm. and all, and then you can actually, it can send, it can take nutrients from one tree and, like, deliver it to another tree, mm -hmm. uh, or, like, if one tree knows where it's, it can identify its child yeah. from, like, the, the networks that connect these organisms underground... Um, there's just there's so many complex things going on that are mind blowing when it gets described. I mean, to think that trees and plants and different things can be talking, mm. you know, mm. via these networks underground is is quite a thing to try and comprehend. But I suppose is that am I correct in saying that that's basically what happens with these networks? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. They be they become like between me and you. You are Chan Scarborough. I'm the Nurtic. You know, it's like. Um, they become what the internet is to us. You know, mm. it's this medium through which me and you can communicate across yeah. across time and space. You know, um, in an in a near immediate way. Mm. Um, so yeah, underground, like the tree will go. The the trees, as the fungi, are also aware and have sensory capabilities. Mm. You know, and can recognize their kin, so to speak. Mm. Um, but they will they will through this network essentially realize that the southern tip of the forest or what of, of the of the network considering how large the, the forest area is um is has less water or less carbon or less um less minerals down that way then there's an abundance here mm -hmm. and then they will funnel those resources through the mycelial networks um to each other and kind of distribute equally distribute the carbon and the resources between the forest or potentially funnel more carbohydrates to their to their kind of smaller kin you know that's not getting the sunshine through the canopy um, or any under, other undergrowth like your ferns and stuff that that's not getting that much sun because of the the canopy is kind of blocking the sunlight and then they'll kind of funnel carbohydrates through photos that the other trees produce through photosynthesis to the other plants yeah. and and I think that's amazing, you know. It's, am it's amazing that they're not only using the fungi 
as a way to to distribute that, but the fungi is almost there, like like ready to mm. do it. You know, it's yeah. like like yeah, just let me know what needs to be done, and then in turn the fungi will obviously take their take their percentage cut from from the carbohydrates that is transferred and or returned minerals that that they can harvest through breaking down rocks yeah. um, or just getting into little nooks and um, crevices that the plant's roots are too big to get to, to source minerals and stuff and then exchange that for carbohydrates. So once again, and like as on a mimicking point of view, you see that the, the fungi really becomes this like selfless mediator between, uh, between other organisms. You know, it's the, it's the medium through which other organisms can then communicate with each other for the sake of forming better relationships and symbiosis and collective health. Um, and it also has this like this this balancing harmonious kind of like role that it plays, you know, in the sense that it never takes more than what it needs. It never it never cheats or steals or you know what I mean? Like like, like hoards too much for itself. It always does the work with the collective in mind and i i really like that about them obviously there's competition on the fungal yeah. in the fungal kingdom as there's always yeah. comp- competition but it's obviously healthy competition exactly and i think yes, if we don't start learning from <laughs> from this intelligence and how to live in in this world we're not gonna we, you know we're gonna run into problems i really for feel sure. like for sure jeepers, like we need to be learning from the way these things work i saw something quite interesting uh i think it was they were trying to map out the best way to network something and then they actually let the mycelium figure out they had different points and then the mycelium figured out the best way to network those different points so you can literally learn Mm -hmm. from from the mycelium networks and you can can learn from how they how they work and how they organize themselves and if we can mimic that i'm pretty sure we'd be in a better place as a society yeah yeah there's so much we can learn from observing them you know from communicating with them from uh, (laughs) um from yeah just how what the role the roles that they play in nature yeah and even in a competitive sense it's always um it always kind of comes down to like restoring harmony or restoring balance and even um, I kind of remind. I'm digressing slightly, but it kind of reminds me. So, over the years, I'd I'd get because I didn't have like a laminar flow hood, which is this this essentially this flow hood that you work in front of that um, that blows air at a certain rate over uh, the work that you do, so as to yeah. stop any spores or dust particles carrying bacteria to drop on the stale work that you're doing okay. i didn't have that so i had to like figure out a way how to create an air still environment as much as possible um while trying to do sterile work and this would obviously lead to some success but mostly failures especially in okay. the beginning of the years as i was developing my understanding of microbiology and the dispersal of spores and bacteria and like what to clean and what not to touch first yeah. or whatever so I'd, I'd have quite a lot of contamination on my petri dishes is what i'm trying to say but it's offered me uh, a lot of insights into like into how they operate, you know, and how they compete and how they sense. And uh, I love telling this story as well because this is probably from an insight gain perspective the 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 most exciting thing that I've 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 kind of like experienced in ob- through observation was I'd have like the mycelium that I'm working with lion's mane, um, oyster mushrooms, whatever the species might be. Quick question to mm. interrupt. You, sorry. It, so the mycelium is standard. It's mycelium is mycelium, and at that it's not like a lion's mane and turkey tail that has different mycelium networks. It's all the mycelium is mycelium. Mm. No. No. So okay. yeah, no. That's so there's different really types of mycelium yeah. networks. Okay. Yeah. So um, well, mycelium would obviously be the the name given to the filamentous network of a fungal organism. Yes. But the fungal organism is a determined species. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's a lot more diverse, and I, I thought it yeah. was a, like the the mycelium was there was a standard that it was mycelium, mm. and then different things came from that. No, that's a really good point. No, so the 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 mycelium of lion's mane um, is its own organism. Oh, wow, so okay. that's the fungus, you know. Okay, and then the okay. lion's mane that we know sure. on the outside, at least, that's the the lion's mane fruit body. Mm. That just has its, and it gets its name obviously from how the fruit body looks. Yeah, it looks so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but like even in this forest setting that we just described, like that's not one mycelial network. That's okay. 
And they can work together. They yeah, interlinked like multiple mm. species of fungi interlinking with multiple species of plants and all right. interlinking with each other. It's a, it's a, it's incredibly complex and diverse um, beyond beyond what I even can comprehend. You know, yeah. um, and I think beyond what even the most brilliant mm. minds in 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 my college today can comprehend or at least describe yeah. or have yet to discover. So we, we're really still on the... That's the thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It feels like we're on the precipice of just discovering more and more and more amazing yeah. things. I think we're only starting to like teeth now, you yeah, know, 100%. In, the, in the world of mycology. It yeah. it's, I, I'm fascinated, and, and we've spoken about this earlier and before, but the the potential benefits for us on, on a, you know, uh, I've, I've loved microdosing, so microdosing psilocybin, but implementing or integrating lion's mane with that and, and looking at it from a nootropic point of view and the, yeah. the, the brain benefits and neurogenesis and the, the, the kind of, I suppose you're taking the mycelium and you're taking these fruit bodies and then you adding it into your diet or lifestyle to mm-hmm. get the mental cognitive benefits and then also the, you know, sports, athletic benefit from like yeah. the cordyceps. Um, yeah, I think there's, um, I think, well, let me put it this way. I think the development of certain products and all these things are like, we're only starting to scratch the surface yeah, now. Yeah, it's things. exciting. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing, man. And um, there's a lot of people doing good stuff in this country around like figuring out different methods of extractions and purifications. Um, I'm I'm somebody that leans more towards like the whole food supplementation, although obviously there is major applications and benefits for like a more concentrated extraction. But it's a very experimental science, the whole extraction of mushrooms, because we know these are safe and they've been used for millennia by traditional cultures and all these things. But we've never extracted them to any form of potency. We know like maybe if you compress... 15 grams of reishi into a 15 milligram extracted resin or powder like what happens then you yeah. know so that's still very much undetermined but lion's man's become extremely popular well regained popularity in recent years for its ability to stimulate nerve growth factor so and brain derived neurotropic factor so it has these two groups of compounds hericinones and erinaceans it gets unnecessarily complex even beyond my point of understanding i've kind of like Mm. submitted myself to just learning about mycology and not the nutritional science or pharmacology behind them but so my understanding i'm trying to say is very is very little in that but with lion's man it's really important to know that there's two groups of compounds that stimulates nerve growth factor arisinones and erinaceans now as I said, science is still in its infancy, but yeah. thus far, hericinones have only been found in the mushrooms and erinaceans have only been found in the mycelium. And it has been shown in vitro, so in petri dish um, studies, that the erinaceans are much uh, better at stimulating nerve growth factor. And there's not really sufficient evidence to show that hericinones can, in fact, cross the blood brain barrier to stimulate nerve growth factor. Although I believe it can, even though the science hasn't proved that yet, because we've got millennia worth of people consuming lion's mane mushroom. That's where my interest in the niacin comes in, because mm-hmm. I've heard something to the niacin assists with that crossing of the blood brain barrier with something to some, I don't know the exact science behind it, but it yeah. helps in some, yeah, something to do with that. So, yeah, I'll share my understanding of that, um, or limited understanding of that in a second as well. But we, we really start to look at like, oh, okay, so the, the consumption of the mushroom does give you the potential for stimulating nerve growth factor. But as far as the science goes right now, if you really want to be scientifically accurate, which I'm half yeah. in, half out always because it's, it's, it's a yeah. flawed method at mm-hmm. best, you know. If not flawed, it's, it's limited in its capacity to show the bigger picture mm-hmm. always. But if you want to be scientific about it, the erinaceans that's found in the mycelium is shown to be a lot stronger and can cross the blood-brain barrier. So for me, when supplementing lion's mane, um, it's important to consider, especially if you're taking it for nerve growth factor properties. The mushroom itself has a lot of benefits for digestive health and uh, um, anti-inflammatory and antioxidants, etc., immunomodulating properties, etc., but if you're specifically taking it for the neurological benefits, which most people do, um, it's important that it includes a form of mycelium. Now, where this gets really tricky uh, is because it's really hard to cultivate or grow my pure mycelium to scale for commercial use because it's 
really tiny. It's really filamentous. It's mm. almost microscopic on a, on a cellular basis unless you have it like clumped up in liquid culture form. So the way it's most easily accessed uh, these days in a way that makes it cost effective at market price or at retail price is people cultivate mycelium on an organic edible substrate. You know, I believe Paul Stamets' business does the same model. Yeah. Um, so there's this whole fermentation process that happening since fungi like like lion's mane are primary decomposers. So when inoculated onto the sterilized organic um, grain substrate, in this case, in their case, brown rice, it will metabolize and consume that rice as it grows through it. It doesn't grow around yes. it or on top of it. It grows through it. Mm. You know, this is this is how they operate. Yeah. But then the metabolites and acids and enzymes they secrete in this process of digesting the rice like adds compounds that are anti inflammatory, immunomodulating, um antioxidants, etc. But then also it's a really good way for us to gain access to to the irinaceans found in the lion's mane mycelium. Mm. Reishi, for instance, also in the mycelium has, oh God, I forget the exact number, but 420-something protein-coding genes in the mycelium versus 90-something in the mushroom alone. Um, so we can really start looking at like accessing mycelium in a way, in this case, so if you, oh, so just to conclude, so then people will go and they will take that, say, after two months of fermentation, which mm -hmm. from, a, from a grain spawn perspective is a long fermentation. Okay. The mushrooms will start fruiting in vitro, so producing fruit bodies on the substrate, which will obviously give you access to the hericinones. So then what I would do mainly for for my sake is then I'll combine that with 50% of just mushroom, you know, so you'll have the, the long fermented, mm -hmm. mycelium fermented, my mycelium on uh, organic brown rice and combine that with 50% fruit body. And now you have the, the kind of best of both in the way that's also affordable. Yeah. Because this will literally be the difference between like paying, say, two rand per gram or 20 rand per gram. Yeah. Now, if you can afford 20 rand per gram and you just want to take the mushroom fruit body, do that. You know, like if I had the option, I'd probably do that as well. But we are literally, we live in a country where, where I guess the separation, the wealth gap is so big that, that mm -hmm. you can't say for people there's this whole thing going on around like mycelium on grain it's like it's a hoax yeah, it's a sham yeah, yeah i see a lot of criticism but it's like with anything there's criticism of course but i know you were, the way you were explaining it to me is even though it's cheaper you actually you want to get the benefits of that mycelium you don't want to yeah. have just the fruit body or yeah so yeah look in a perfect world we'd be able to with the right money and equipment essentially like have pure mycelium cultivate okay. mycelium and you know those tanks that they do like wine yeah. or yeah, bubbly yeah, yeah, or yeah, something okay. in um like when big tanks like yeah. that and we can get tens of kilos of pure dried mycelium mm. out like on a weekly basis that's the ideal world if anybody wants to give me a few million i can make that yeah. happen <laughs> but like it's really expensive and even then we'll only be catering to once again yeah. The as as we've kind of jokingly called it the Constantia diet, you know, the like yeah. the really <laughs> the it's really like a, upper class. Yeah, it's waters. amazing how people focus on that, but just just get it in, get it in. It's good for you. So like, yeah. if you forget forget the like powdered, if we can somehow extract or remove the rice and remain with the mycelium, even better, yeah. you know. But now we're looking at something that's accessible, it's affordable, it's immunologically and neurologically active. Um, science is still a little bit behind on that. But also we're looking at a method of cultivation. It's extremely easy to cultivate that. And set and forget for two months, it's relatively easy. And this is part of what makes it affordable. But we, I can really start looking. And this is kind of a pipe dream that I have once I start freeing up some time. Is I'd love to go into the communities around Cape Town and teaching them these methods. Because yeah. they have glass jars that they can reuse with modified lids, with cheap DIY uh, methods that they can go... I'll supply the cultures for free mm. as a, I guess, my giving back to the community mm. part. And then they can cultivate or expand that mycelium infinitely, but they can cultivate a variety of different, it doesn't have to be lion's mane, it can be shiitake, it can be oyster mushrooms, it can be reishi, it could be turkey tail, on edible grains as a way, it doesn't even have to be brown rice, it can be sorghum, it could be corn, it could be chickpeas, soybeans, you know. Mm. But then they can cultivate these 
mycelial uh, cultures on edible substrates in a way that gives them calories as well as immunological uh, uh, benefits you know so now we're looking at food security on a whole other level and forget about your elitist uh, like high performance high potency extraction and rather start looking at how can we access not more health products or more extractions or more, uh, you know, concentrated pharmacological yeah. things, but how can we access mycelium in a way that's accessible to all people that maybe I can take, I call them cupcakes, you know, I can take this lion's mane fermented rice, um, rice cake out, cut it into strips and like fry it up and we can make vegan burgers with that, you know, it yeah. tastes like crayfish, it has that lion's yeah. mane flavor. Um so now we start looking at like low tech ways of integrating my mycology and mycelial as well as mushroom foods and medicines, not into the health stores or into the pharmacies or into um, un- unnecessarily marked uh, expensive or highly marked up uh, uh, products, but in a way that it's like accessible to everybody. Because now we're not only bringing a lot of good medicine and good food to the table, but we are literally building a better relationship with fungi not as a person or as a company or as a business but as as a humanity Mm -hmm. and then we'll start looking at fast forwarding mycological technologies or having it so accessible that that some genius figures out a way to cultivate pure mycelium in a way that's equally as accessible you know um so that's my kind of dream it's like let's not throw throw the mycelium out with the yeah. with the right with the organic brown rice just yet yeah. let's access that technology in a way that that gives more people access to these medicines yeah especially those who are lacking nutrition and lacking yes. you know you yes. could get it out into poor areas and they could learn mm-hmm. to do something like this yeah the, the suppose what the limits are, are endless with what you could do with this absolutely yeah, and the only place where that becomes unmoral or a moral issue for me as most people who quite frankly don't understand what fungi are and what mycelial networks are and how they operate how they digest them Mm. the chemical complexities behind them um i kind of lost my point now but instead of oh instead of saying like oh that's a sham that's a scam that's that's not pure mushrooms that's not a pure product instead of doing that like saying like okay if it's labeled correctly and it's priced accordingly, if it's affordable, it's accessible and it's labeled as mushroom mycelium powder mm. um, of mycelium fermented organic brown rice and it's labeled correctly and priced accordingly, mm. now more people have access yeah. to this. You know, Now maybe you can take 20 grams of that at a time at the same price as somebody else can take a pure mycelial mm. extraction or pure mushroom mm. extract or mushroom powder um, for the same price of one gram, you know what I mean? So we, yeah. we're looking at access now first. Um, and the technologies, the science, the equipment, the industry will catch up eventually. But let's yeah. not let's not let's not give our entire group of people not give an entire group of people access to yeah. these medicines and foods just because it's it's not because you're trying to get a very specific way of doing it. It's not pharmacologically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> amazing. Um, and and scalability is it is it what you're doing is it easy to scale it more and more? Because I know you said you, you battle to almost keep up with the supply, for instance, of the lion's mane yes. and move it. So there's obviously an interest to get it out to enough people. Is it is it easy easily scalable? It, uh, if you have enough money, yes, everything okay. is like scalable to that sense. But for instance, and this is what we before the podcast started spoke about lion's mane mushroom for instance is one of those ones as well that it's it's 90 percent water so mm-hmm. if i harvest 10 kilograms yesterday from the facility in the dehydrator six hours later it's cr- uh, crispy dry you know it's perfect that's one kilogram you know now um yeah um if yeah. if we don't combine that with the mycelial part as well then now we've got okay one kilogram from all that input what's that going to cost maybe sell it at X amount at wholesale, you know, because Mm -hmm. other people want to put microdose capsules or put that in their product line or whatever. So now by the time it reaches the customers, it's really expensive. Um, But also, so then it's hard to scale um, in that sense. So we have to cultivate a lot more to get to a point where we can, where we can like have, we can essentially cover the demand, you know. Sure. Um, so yeah, it's definitely scalable, but yeah. it's you need you need yeah. 
you need oh and uh, this is the another point that i wanted to make so as i've scaled up through the years you know like from one or two blocks of lines man doing the experimental phases to 10 to mm. 20 to trying to get 100 into into a fruiting chamber at a time you know um you also realize that that it's not it's not it's not scalable in the sense that it's just like, oh, if you did this much for two and you want to do 20, just times it by 10, you know? Yeah. It's like, because then you run into other contamination issues or yeah. slower colonization times or longer sterilization times for the substrate. So then it's like... Quite a science. Yeah, you got to kind of figure figure, yeah. figure a few more things out. So in that sense, I'm still learning mm. with regards to scale. Um, I've lost lost a lot of work and okay. time and energy and resources trying to think that you yeah. could just times things by 10 and it's okay. the exact same process. So it's a learning process. It's yes. a learning process. Yeah. I want to touch on quickly. Um, so we've d done a, a bit of lion's mane, which is fascinating. Um, so I know the other kind of main ones are like the reishi, the turkey tail, the cordyceps, mm. uh, the chaga. I know there's quite a bit of talk around chaga and also cordyceps. Yeah. Um, like... In like layman's terms, what are the benefits of those 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 strains? I know the cordyceps is more focused around training, athletic performance. Is yeah. it like how is that working in the body? How is it increasing your athletic performance or your physical? Yeah. Um, what are the benefits of cordyceps in that regard? And then chakha is chakha like a stimulant? Somebody told me you could yeah. actually use it as like a replacement for coffee. Is that true? Yeah, it'll it'll be like a. a a non-stimulating replacement for coffee, okay. I would say, but it's, it looks like coffee. It, okay. It's very dark. It like a few yeah. people that I've seen it, I'm like, Oh, it's this chaga tea. Like, why is it so dark? It looks like Muti, you know, like Aya brew or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it looks like, they were like, well, what's this going to do? Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like, just think of it as coffee, you know, it's okay. got a very neutral, earthy flavor. Okay. So very easy to add to other things or maybe like just sweeten a little bit or have it like, decaf coffee in there to just like give you the coffee experience but i have to first say that my understanding of how these things work in the body is really limited it's yeah. not my area of expertise i i i have read many scientific studies and articles by other people who are qualified in this field mm -hmm. to describe it in more detail and I often do get lost or I'll memorize the perfect way to say that paragraph and sentence and then two months later I'll be like oh you know I've forgotten yeah yeah, yeah okay. cuz uh, nutritional science biochemistry yeah. pharmacology these things is are yeah. extremely complex at least mm. for myself and how my mind works although it is still a passion of mine yeah. Um, but so chaga is probably one of the most, I guess, nutrient or medicinal compound or alkaloid dense herbal supplements in the world. And it's, yeah. it really is a powerhouse of nutrition. And oftentimes when people say, just quick, I don't want the long spiel, just quick, just tell me what, what's chaga yeah, good yeah, for yeah. I'm like, Oh, don't do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> because first of all, it's hard to, and second of all, I literally is going to sound like I'm just throwing words out there. Yes. Because it literally, I feel like it does have benefits for almost everything, you know. Yeah. So chaga, chaga is the highest antioxidant count of any natural food or herb. Okay. It's way above cacao. It's way really? above yeah. goji berries, way above blueberries. Um, yeah, cacao is probably at the top of that list. And then, I don't know if the camera can, but you can see like if say yeah. that's cacao's um, uh, a count on the ORAC scale, which is the oxygen radical absorbance capacity. Okay. So how effective it is at absorbing free radicals. Um, oxidative stress. Yes. If that's cacao, like chaga will be like there. So it's, say, three times as much. What? Yeah, okay. it's, it's crazy high in Everybody's like crazy on cacao at the moment. And even I've been yeah. like, okay, cacao is interesting. And I, yeah. I, I take cacao with, uh, for other benefits, with, with the psilocybin microbes. Yeah. Because also got, you know, the tryptophan and it stimulates that 5 HTP and gets that whole serotonin yeah. system going. God, it's uh, brilliant. There's so many benefits. So you said the chaga has actually got more antioxidant properties. Yeah, it. more antioxidants. And, um, sure. uh, but I, uh, cacao is actually my favorite carrier of mm. these medicinal mushrooms and we can get into that just now from an administrative perspective. Okay. Uh, but, and then it's, 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 I think, the highest anti-tumor properties of any kind of herbal medicine or herbal supplement. Uh, it's very high in melanin, which okay. translates to skin, nail, hair, eye health. Right. Um, some people would even go so like, they're like, my eyes are more blue. I've been taking chaga for like a few weeks. You know, they feel this just this like glow mm. come on from which I would guess I would con uh, attribute to the, the melanin content and the antioxidants yeah. and the polyphenols in there. 
But then it's got a lot of minerals and nutrients and uh, magnesium and then antiviral, um, uh, antibacterial properties as well. And this is kind of like the foundation of medicinal mushrooms because they are kind of active in the microbial mm. world and very, very, well, they live and thrive in microbially dense and competitive environments. So they're very good at, at having these compounds that are antiviral and antibacterial yeah. but then their cell walls are made of a dietary fiber quite frankly called very fancy word polysaccharides or beta glucans okay. very very tough kind of bonds uh, or complex carbohydrates that triggers in a, a modulated immune response in our mm. bodies so it's carbohydrate molecules that's too large to get broken down um in, in the gut so when it passes through your immune system essentially gets gets a red alert signature that there's a foreign body, you know, in your digestive tract, and then it stands on alert. So very simplified way to explain how it modulates your immune system or, like, keeps your immune system sharp. Mm. And all mushrooms have their own kind of novel or own particular polysaccharide, um, um, uh, polysaccharides and beta-glucans that modulates oh. or stimulates a modulated immune response in different ways. Okay. So the more mushrooms you have together in your diet or supplementing with, the better mm. because you'll have a wider spectrum of immune modulating triggers. So you'll have a, a, a larger spectrum of a kind of immune system upgrade. Um, and that's really exciting because then people always ask me, can you take them together? When should yeah. I take what? And the more the merrier really. But also tell people like, don't don't just go buy the tinctures or the supplements, you know, like do that, especially yeah. if you're looking for specific treatments or sp specific health benefits, but also eat the oyster mushrooms, you know, like mm. buy that bag of dried shiitake at the farmer's market yes. next time you see it. Or if you yeah. know a friend that knows how to forage, go out with them and pick some wild mushrooms, you know, yeah. expose yourself to them as much as possible for yeah. the immune benefits and the, mm. the kind of total system upgrade mm. that you get from them. But also for a wider spectrum of nutrients, a wider spectrum of medicinal mm -hmm. compounds. Um, so, yeah, the more the, more the yeah. merrier, really. Yeah, there's no, there's no right or wrong way. Just get mushrooms yeah. in and it'll be yeah. good for you. They're extremely yeah. tasty, as yeah. I'm sure you know. They're a yeah. good source of protein, good source of magnesium. Yeah. So good. There was a, there was a, a woman at um, the Reinertzach Market in Cape Town. Yeah. She had that fantastic fungi I saw, and she would sell, like, kebabs of like these mush built different so mushrooms it's so good so good so good <laughs> yeah. watch this day, yeah, shout out to that lady for yeah. her mushroom kebabs like yeah, that's amazing <laughs> so so good yeah. um cordyceps just quickly touch on that what is the definitely my favorite fungus okay. so first of all we started with cordyceps sinensis which is the wild forest version of what today is cordyceps militaris more yeah. popular and I won't go too long into that because I know we are. We've been spinning on for a while. Yeah, and we can I know. <laughs> but so cordyceps sinensis is the uh, well, cordyceps first of all is a is a species of fungus that's an entomopathogenic fungus, which means that it it essentially feeds off insects, okay. uh, kills and and feeds off insects. So cordyceps sinensis is on some kind of caterpillar. Um, for some reason, escapes me now. I've told this story many times. But in the Himalayas, in the Himalayan mountain uh, regions or the mountain meadows, they would forage, wild forage, these cordyceps and ensis mushrooms, tiny little mushrooms that grows from this caterpillars under the ground, sprouts the mushroom from the head of the insect after consuming the non-vital essential, yeah. uh, the non-essential or non-vital organs, then taking over its nervous system, directing it to a place where it's essential or ideal for the mushroom to sprout. Mm -hmm. And then these the indigenous people there would like find these little mushrooms sticking out from the ground and then dig out the entire mushroom with the myceliated bug and then sell that at market. So the I think in 1993, the Chinese Olympic uh, women's Olympic track team or something all broke records and naturally got tested for steroids, you know, came back clean and eventually the coach kind of came out that they were all drinking this cordyceps tea. And following this was just a boom in interest for this this wild harvested cordyceps sinensis to the point where I think it reached something like, tw don't quote me on this number, but something like $20,000 per kilogram, maybe more. Um, that's playing it, playing it safe with that number. 
So it was just major, major, major boom in interest, but then also major socio-economic socio, um, envi environmental impacts with regards to the overharvest of Cordyceps sinensis, which then led to people trying to cultivate these mushrooms, and, uh, first on insects and then on a variety of grains. And from that came the commercial um, strain for, of Cordyceps sinensis called Cordyceps CS4. Uh, Cordyceps sinensis CS4. But this is a non-mushroom producing uh, strain of Cordyceps sinensis. So all Cordyceps sinensis CS4 or Cordyceps sinensis that's available, that's not wild forage on the market today will be this mycelium cultivated on, um, uh, on rice or on any mm. choice of grain. And that's fine. That's great. That's initially what I got to know Cordyceps on. But then in the years, like five, six years ago, but then over the years, there were two, two or three guys. I don't want to not mention one of them for the sake of not giving credit where credit's due, but the two that I know best, uh, best is Ryan Paul Gates and William Padilla Brown um, in the United States that I think William Padilla Brown was the first to essentially f cultivate Cordyceps militaris, um, this, this orange mushroom that we all mm. know and love today, um, on grain and then the, um, there was another there was a third guy there that also played a big part in the the boom and breeding for commercial cordyceps militaris mm -hmm. strains and between the three of those guys like they changed commercial cordyceps game completely because of the strains and the genetics that they put out for people to cultivate commercially and continue sure. to breed them like high yielding high potency uh, cordyceps militaris strain that obviously took a lot of strain off the wild forage cordyceps sinensis kind of um, impact and environmental and eco of ecological and socioeconomic impacts um, because also it's not only cheaper it produces high levels of cordyceps and adenosine, the two kind of most common uh, compounds responsible for the energy production of cordyceps. But it's pretty much a little bit of figuring out of recipes and all these things and setups and whatever. You can grow your own cordyceps and sell that relatively cheap in comparison to the cordyceps and ensis. Now, these two compounds, cordyceps and adenosine, are the two main compounds that be, that are tested for and sought after in cordyceps taken for athletic performance. And this is because of its ability to ramp up ATP synthesis. So this is the body's uh, 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 kind of energy currency, mm. so to speak, that it produces energy from glycogen um, through the mitochondria, um, called ATP and then the production of from from ATP um, uh, from ADP to ATP and the process that that takes essentially will translate to how fast you recover in between sets or say during um, um, aerobic exercise like running or then uh, in between sets of anaerobic exercise like weightlifting or short bursts of sprints you know and this will translate to olympic lifting or kind of like more um, explosive sports like mma or mm. combat sports or rugby or whatever the case might be so if you have an upgraded ATP synthesis, it means that your body restores the energy molecules a lot faster, which means that you recover faster in between sets or you, it takes longer for you to run out of energy uh, or out of ATP that the body can make. So this translates to increased performance, increased endurance, increased strength output. And this is incredible. Anybody that loves any kind of sport or training mm. sessions or anything like wants that yeah. you know that's that's why pre-workouts are multi-billion <laughs> yeah. industry um globally that's just, that's insane like the pre-workout industry when i was younger i used to take a lot but you're sacrificing some things to gain in other things yeah. whereas something like this you're just gaining that's a very good point, Darren. Yeah, because now you're taking something mm. that ramps up HB synthesis and then there's um, oxygen utilization yeah. as well which is really cool yeah. as there's not a lot of things that can do that so that's a very good point but not only are you revving up your energy production on a sustainable level but you're taking something that's immunologically yeah. active that's anti-inflammatory that balances out your hormones mm -hmm. um that improves your your sex drive it's also yeah. very well known aphrodisiac Incredible. full of antioxidants so you get a total yeah. system nourishment and upgrade as well as get that that desired 
um, pre-workout yeah. boost, you know? And, and practically speaking, would you take cordyceps before training or at the beginning of the day, end of the day? Is there any kind of protocol that you would follow or just get yeah. it in kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. I, I, for me at this stage, it's get it in kind of thing, you know? Okay. In the early years, I did have the whole like pre-workout approach and okay. I could take, it an, <laughs> take it an hour before, you know, like mm. like with a cup of coffee, a half an hour off, just as you start like putting your shoes on. But yeah. these days, like I, just, I have it in the morning with my Lions, man, because... Okay. I don't know if it's a because I've been taking it for the last five years that maybe it's different for me now than it was then. I don't really have that that mm. immediate comparison anymore. But but I almost feel like if I take cordyceps in the morning, like the energy boost or the energy like it gives me like lasts until the evenings. You know, yeah. sometimes at six p.m. I'm still very much switched on and energized, yeah. even though I've had a session, a two-hour session, you know, or um, or maybe even more. Yeah. But yeah, so that's that to me is like why it's it's groundbreaking because like if you're not an athlete, you maybe do run, do run five k's every Saturday morning. But who in this world in this modern era cannot benefit from improved energy that balances out your hormones, that gives you immune system support and um, uh, liver support and all these things? Yeah. You know, it's like if there's more energy available and more oxygen available, that also means that your very power hungry brain gets more. Mm. More to do calculations and thinking and and, and yeah. computing with yes yeah that's right up my alley I think as I've been on my exploration of health and wellness and all these things it's becoming very conscious of what you're putting in your body and and the more natural the better and then something like this where it's it's just it just ticks all the boxes for me I'm I'm excited to actually get more uh, mycology or my, um, fungal products into my diet and yeah really really explore it more man it's exciting it's so exciting and it's um unfortunately we're like in south africa a little bit behind on the like mm. commercial production of certain mushrooms but i think in the next five years maybe three depending yeah. on how 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 much resources are available to the to mm. investing in equipment and strains because this is the thing with cultivating cordyceps is the genetics unlike any other mushrooms that can be used and expanded infinitely for a long amount of time the genetics kind of senesces um <laughs> it senesces in uh in like three months yeah we don't have any cordyceps breeders in south africa it's really hard to bring it in because of our customs backlog you know this this culture will probably sit at customs for two months and if it does clear yeah. you've got a month to pump out as much as possible before it senesces to the point where it doesn't yield as much or doesn't even produce mushrooms at all but that's what's cool. You do that locally. Yeah, it's just amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's been a mission, Darren, to yeah. like get good cordyceps genetics. Yeah, um, into the country where where you only really know like a month after doing all the work you did whether the genetics you got was going to like really be worthy of because cordyceps, unlike like lion's mane that I just mentioned as the where the science stands now like there's not much value for energy production from consuming the mycelium on rice you know so this yeah. is the one thing where you don't really want to necessarily include that because it according to the science has negligible amounts of this cordyceps and adenosine still immunologically active still anti-inflammatory properties and oftentimes the, the cordy cakes as i call them that's left after the uh, the, the cultivation and the harvest of the mushrooms I will either fry those up and eat those as a as a tempeh cordyceps tempeh patty, you know, make like a yeah. burger with it or whatever. Or if I have too much to know what to do with, I'll dry or I'll bake them in the oven and then I'll just mm. grind them up with a coffee grinder and for myself to eat, you know. Yeah. Um, then I won't take it for energy, but mainly just for mm. immune benefits, not to like waste it or just compost it. Mm. Um, but it is one of those mushrooms that's one of those fungi that you really, for the energy sake, want to consume the mushrooms. My, if you're getting subpar cordyceps genetics, like your yields are going to be ridiculously small. And you spent a lot of time, energy, effort, resources um, into cultivating them. So I really look forward to the next few years, not only for myself to find them to grow better cordyceps, and we will soon. Yeah. I definitely think you're in a place where I could see you doing like the all the things that you've learned over the last few years. You could start teaching people how to do that as well. For sure. I really feel like you have, there's a space for, for sure. people to learn and, and expand and and, and yeah, yeah. There's, there's so much to it. Yeah, man, and I've I've uh, this is 
counterproductive to my own business model, at least for the time being. I'm flexible in what I can do mm. business-wise in that sense because I'm at the core of, of, of this the cultivation, the development of strains. Maybe I'll end up breeding cordyceps one day. You know, maybe I'll fill that gap. Yeah. Uh, I don't know yet. We'll see. We see where the fungi takes me, or where they where they need me, so to speak. Yeah. But yeah, maybe maybe um, I want I want I want medicinal mushrooms and functional fungi. As it's now known because it's just a little bit more yeah. all encompassing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't. I, I would really like to see. I'll be. It will probably be out of my control, but it. It stay out of the hands of monopolization and big corporations and one company that does all the exports or holds all the the cultivation or all the knowledge and nobody knows anything. Yeah. I, I want it to be a people science. You know, my college yeah. as a science is only about a hundred and something years old, and for the first ninety percent of that time, it existed purely for the sake of uh, developing fungicides for the agricultural mm -hmm. industry. You know, profit driven. Yeah. Yeah, there's always that, that, that danger. And I think like in the States as well, with all the research going on with the benefits of psilocybin and yes. it's like it's been massive progress in that. And then it's like you see the farmer, um, big farmer trying to jump on it and then create their patterns to have the... And it's like, okay, yes, let's also try not to make a big corporate thing out of this. Yes. And, 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 you know, um, yeah, for sure. Or even just like one big health company like yeah. selling it all, you know, like... Synthesizing the compounds. Yeah. And, yeah. Out competing the other yeah. one or squashing other people, out marketing because oftentimes yeah. like these people like... Uh, like bigger companies like it's not even that the quality of the product is that much better there's just more money going yeah. towards marketing mm -hmm. you know yeah. what i mean 100%. so like i really want it to be a people's science yeah. um, what if what if me and you can both grow cordyceps yeah. you know and then supply That's the it. people it's, yeah it's that conscious way of i think the future is it's not about it's it's collaboration over competition I think that's, that's the best way to sum it up. And I think if we can view the world that way and not view it from a place of lack and fear, like I need to do it for me and drive, let's all do it. Let's yes. collaborate. Let's see how we can all add value and then get a prosperous society going. I, think I love that so much. Yeah. And I love the way you put it there as well. And I also believe it's collaboration through competition. Yeah, yeah, you know, Healthy because yeah. yeah, and I've got guys in the kind of, uh, well, I want to say in my network, they are doing their own thing and empowered to their own degree but like in the harmonic mycologies like network that like we're all working together and sharing genetics and passing on cultures and all that but like there's still an essence of like if one of them are doing something cool i'll be like oh yeah. you know like i want to do that you know and then it yes. like sparks that like excitement you know so there's collaborative competition as well but yeah. i really want to see this this development and we are actively looking for and cloning indigenous species of reishi heresium okay. uh, turkey tail and all these things so that we can like add to the strain bank for potential future biomaterial research you know for sustainable yeah. packaging that somebody wants to run with here's yeah. the culture see if this one works see if that one works you know amazing or for cultivation, like this indigenous reishi produces this compound and whatever <laughs> yeah so I'll I'll give those cultures that I've isolated and do it, like found in South Africa and yeah. for commercial growth, like to anybody that wants to, that will obviously mm. shares the, these morals and wants to for develop sure. uh, develop something from those those cultures. Yeah, well, I think the future is exciting, and I'm actually keen to learn more from you and collaborate more with you in the future. I sure, think there's, there's a lot um, that 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 that's going to happen in the future. I really, really believe that. Lastly, to finish off, because we've got to end off soon, mm. um, for the average person who's going to the shops buying mushrooms to eat, like there is benefits still in doing I mean, you don't have to go out and get your lion's mane. You can, can you still get some benefits from the average mushrooms you're going to buy and pick and pay for it? So sure. It's there. Definitely you can. Yeah. yeah. So even the, the kind of... <laughs> The, everybody knows the, the white button mushroom. <laughs> yeah. you know? Like in the beginning years, it was like, oh, I'm doing this mushroom thing. I'm like, I like button mushrooms. Like, no, no, no. They're like, like no, 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 no. It's like medicinal mushrooms is a whole other category, but everybody yeah. knows the button mushroom. Um, even those have polysaccharides that's immunologically active. Um, they have high levels yeah. of magnesium. They're a good source of protein, you know, so yeah. there's that. Oyster mushrooms, highly medicinal mushrooms um, yeah. as well. For me, the, the, the line between gourmet and medicinal mushrooms is literally just texture. Something okay. like reishi and turkey tail, chaga as well, way too hard to chop up and enjoy in a stir fry, you know? Yeah. So we'll have to develop 
different ways of accessing those nutrients and that's maybe making a tea or making a tincture or making both and combining them together and making a dual extract or okay. heat treating them and powdering them so we can take them in capsules or in smoothies you know so that's the yeah that'll yes. be the okay. difference for me between medicinal and gourmet because even um even your your gourmet mushroom shiitake is highly medicinal mushroom as well. A lot of people use that for for um, health benefits yeah. also. So yeah, Amazing. eat eat, eat whatever you can. Whatever get. you can. <laughs> They're delicious. Think make tempura oyster yeah, mushrooms. Yeah, yeah. You know, make um, uh, make mushroom kebabs and yeah, nuggets and do what you need to do. Yeah. Just eat as many mushrooms. In, as, in a greater variety of species as possible, yeah. I, th- I think that was the, what I took away from that first ever podcast. And ever since then, every time, every single time I eat mushrooms, I'm like, yes, yes. Yes, <laughs> yes <laughs> I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah do that more, yeah, just, you know. Just, it's a great yeah, source of protein. Yeah. It's sustainable. It's medicinal. It's yeah. immunologically active. It's yeah. nutrient-dense. Like, I see no reason why not to. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. And brother, just to end off, where can people find you? I know you have us on Instagram and stuff. Mm-hmm. I'll link your details in the show notes for people to find out more but where can they find your products and yeah so products well i've pulled away from from um like bigger retailers and like i want to drive direct sales and then we had a few health stores um that that Mm. is owned by people that i have a personal relationship with and the names of those people instead of me forgetting to mention one of them now you can find on the website it's harmonicmycology.com on there we also have an events page where you can see upcoming events whether it's mushroom themed dinners forages talks uh podcasts i'll link this one in there as well uh once it's live so yeah events are on there a little bit of what we're about our instagram is um harmonic underscore mycology um i'm very much active on there i've i'm i've pulled away from facebook yeah. for obvious reasons mm-hmm. and yeah, um, likewise. yeah so um so instagram I'm, I'm fairly active on there just mainly from an aesthetics like visual perspective yeah. but then on the website it's a little bit outdated at this stage mm-hmm. but um, i will catch up to that soon we've got resources there books talks uh podcasts from other people that we like to listen to or read or or, or access for knowledge yeah. Um, yeah, everything is on there. And if you guys want to reach me directly or if at least via email, just send an email to info at harmonicmycology.com. And if you want to get on board in any way, cultivating mushrooms, you want to start your own thing, buy cultures, mm. get grain spawn. If I can't help you out with specifically what you need, I'll send you to somebody that might or will be able to. So let's... Um, yeah, yeah, let's collaborate. Let's connect. Let's do don't it. my problem. Don't buy my product. Make your own. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, that's what I want to do. So yeah, I'm definitely for sure. <laughs> yeah. you, Bruce. Oh, that's Kiff. I love that. Yeah, Kiff, man. Thank you for awesome. the for the opportunity to yeah. obviously come talk to somebody that's that's equally yeah, as interested man. and switched it's, on about this, but also just your platform and your 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 knowledge and yeah. interest. I really Thanks, appreciate really. that, my I'm brother. Just trying to hold a space to put the stuff out there. And that's yeah. what it's about, and I think um, yeah, podcasts have changed my life. So it's like let's do more of it let's, I love let's it get it out there thank so. you for what you do thank you for you I appreciate it Kiff bro yeah I oh. appreciate it thanks man awesome man that's a wrap bam yeah fuck <laughs>